Thanks very much, Pete. Um, and thanks to Bill uh, also for the very warm invitation. I never um, got a chance to meet Ted, which I really regret. Everything I've heard here today and yesterday, it makes me think that he was um, somebody special and somebody that um, I might have been friends with. Uh, I understand that he was a fan of driving, uh, of cars and such, so I'm gonna begin with an anecdote um, that he might have appreciated. So there was one time when uh, one of Google's self-driving cars came up to an intersection that was a four-way stop. And so it came to a halt and uh, waited for the other cars to do the same before proceeding through, because apparently that's the rule it was taught. But of course, that's not what people do. Uh, so the robot car got completely paralyzed and just sort of froze uh, blocked the intersection and uh, had to be towed out of there. Um, I like to imagine there was like some, you know, <laughs> big guy in a tow truck, really filthy, who had to come and get it out of there. Just, I like the contrast. Um, so tellingly, the Google engineer who was in charge of this project said that what he had learned from this episode is that, quote, Human beings need to be less idiotic. So let's think about that. If there's an ambiguous case of right of way, human drivers will often make eye contact. Um, maybe one waves the other through or indicates by the movements of the car itself a readiness to yield or not. It's not a stretch to say that there's a kind of body language of driving and a range of driving dispositions. We are endowed with social intelligence through the exercise of which people work things out among themselves and usually manage to cooperate well enough. Tocqueville thought it was in small bore practical activities demanding co improvisation and cooperation that the habits of collective self-government are formed. And this is significant. There's something that can aptly be called the democratic personality. And it's cultivated not in civics class, but in the granular features of everyday life. But the social intelligence on display at that intersection was completely invisible to the Google guy. And this too is significant. The premise behind the push for driverless cars is that human beings are terrible drivers. You hear that all the time. So this is, I think, one instance of a wider pattern. There's a tacit picture of the human being that guides our institutions and that provides um, a shared intellectual DNA for the governing classes. It has various elements, but in this talk, I wanna suggest that uh, the common thread is a low regard for human beings, whether on the premise of their fragility their cognitive limitations, their latent tendency to hate, or their imminent obsolescence with the arrival of imagined technological possibilities. Each of these premises carries an important but partial truth, and each provides the master supposition for some project of social control. We're sliding toward a post-political mode of governance in which expert administration replaces democratic contest and political sovereignty is relocated from representative bodies to bureaucracies that are largely unaccountable. Common sense is disqualified as a guide to reality. And with this disqualification, the political standing of the majority is demoted as well. The new anti-humanisms can only accelerate these trends. They serve as apologetics for a further concentration of wealth and power and the further erosion of the concept of the citizen. I mean the wide awake, imperfect, but responsible human being on whom the ideal of self-government rests. That older ideal has its roots in the long arc of Western civilization. 
In the Christian centuries, man was conceived to be fallen, yet created in the image of God. You don't have to be a Christian to see that this doubleness, this awareness of sin and of our orientation toward perfection, can help us to clarify the effects of our current anti-humanisms, criticize their presuppositions, and look for an exit from the uncanny new forms of tyranny that are quickly developing. The four anti-humanisms, as I see it, are these. Human beings are stupid, we're obsolete, we're fragile, and we're hateful. I submit that these four premises are mutually supporting and that uh, together they serve to legitimize and usher in more fully the post-political condition. One thing they have in common is that if taken to heart, they attenuate the citizenly pride that is both cause and effect of self-government. So, number one, we're stupid. In the decades after World War II, the rational actor model of human behavior was the foundation of economic thinking. It treated people as agents who act to maximize their utility, which required the further assumption that they act with a perfectly lucid grasp of where their interests lie and how they can be secured. <clears throat> These assumptions might seem psychologically naive, but they provided the tacit anthropology for what we might call the party of the market. What is called liberalism in Europe, but in the Anglophone world is associated with figures such as Ronald Reagan and uh, Margaret Thatcher. In the 1990s, this intellectual edifice was deposed by the more psychologically informed school of behavioral economics, which teaches that our actions are largely guided by pre-reflective cognitive biases and heuristics. These offer fast and frugal substitutes for conscious deliberation, which is a slow and costly activity. This was a necessary correction of our view of the human person in the direction of realism. But something went awry in the institutionalization of these insights. In the psychological literature that this sort of kind of economics is based on, one thing that stands out is that our sub-rational modes of coping with the world are actually pretty rational in the Bayesian sense. That is, the biases and heuristics we rely on correspond to real regularities in the world and provide a good basis for action. But the practical adequacy of so-called sub-rational modes of coping with the world dropped out of consideration when the social engineers got a hold of what looked like a promising new toolkit for evidence-based interventions, as well as a fresh rationale for intervening. Biases, <clears throat> those are bad. People are sub-rational. We knew it all along. Their takeaway was that people need all the help they can get in the form of external nudges and cognitive scaffolding if they are to do the rational thing. In a sense, they're correct. A level-headed <clears throat> Burkean version of their thesis, <clears throat> excuse me, would stress that with the external scaffolding of settled usages and inherited forms, we don't have to wake up every morning and deduce the necessity of each action from first principles entirely on our own. It would acknowledge the rationality of tradition as a set of framing conditions for individual choice. Instead, for the nudgers, rationality is to be located neither in the individual nor in tradition uh, and settled cultural forms, but in a separate class of social managers acting according to a vision that is theirs alone. They aim to create a choice architecture that will guide us beneath the threshold of our awareness. The nudge is a non-coercive way to alter people's behavior without having to persuade them of anything. That is, without the inconvenience of having to engage in democratic politics. 
Following the publication of Nudge by Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler in 2009, both the Obama White House and the government of David Cameron in the UK immediately established behavioral insight teams. Such units are currently operating in the European Commission, the United Nations, the WHO, and by Thaler's own reckoning, about 400 other entities in government and the NGO world, as well as in countless private corporations. It would be hard to overstate the degree to which this approach has been institutionalized. The innovation achieved here at scale is in the way government conceives its subjects. Not as citizens whose considered consent must be secured, but as particles to be steered through a science of behavior management that relies on our pre-reflective biases. The glee and sheer repetition with which this diminished picture of the human subject as being cognitively incompetent was trumpeted by journalists and popularizers in the 2010s indicates that it has some moral appeal, quite apart from its intellectual merits. Perhaps it's the old enlightenment thrill at disabusing human beings of their pretensions to specialness, whether as made in the image of God or as the rational animal, as in Aristotle. A likely effect of this demotion is to attenuate the pride of the citizen, and so make us more acquiescent to the work of those whom C.S. Lewis called the conditioners. <clears throat> Number two, we're obsolete. Closely allied with the idea that we're stupid is the idea that human beings are essentially inferior versions of computers, and therefore the weak link in any system. To return to my opening example, human beings are said to be terrible drivers. This is why we need driverless cars. The first thing to know is that the push for driverless cars is not in response to consumer demand. It's a top-down effort. When Pew polls people about their attitudes on this, majorities express reservations about autonomous cars, and many people say they prefer to drive themselves. So this might be viewed as a case of for-profit social engineering, relying heavily on the rhetoric of inevitability. Recall the Google guy who was dealing with the paralyzed robot car and concluded from the experience that human beings need to be less idiotic. Now maybe he was a classic computer nerd, a little bit on the spectrum, who has a hard time perceiving social things, such as the way an intersection actually works. But he needn't have been. He need only have been well steeped in the prevailing account of how the human mind works, which is called the computational theory of mind. The origins of this lie with cybernetics in the years immediately after World War II. Mentation as computation continues to provide the intellectual foundation for the mainstream of cognitive science, despite coming in for devastating critique from the more phenomenologically oriented dissidents within that discipline, who emphasize the embodied nature of human intelligence and the fact that it is socially bootstrapped. That is, <clears throat> our apprehension of the world isn't something that takes place entirely within our heads, like a brain in a vat. As Merleau-Ponty argued, even for such straightforward processes as visual perception, we rely on taken-for-granted cultural norms that can't really be captured algorithmically. As a zombie metaphor that can't be killed, mind as computer, anchors the popular superstition and marketing hype according to which machines are said to have artificial intelligence. A term of mystification that carries a tacit assertion that what a binary computer does is something very like human intelligence. And reciprocally, what the human mind does, not very well, unsurprisingly, is compute. Bad philosophy of mind tends to be the most well capitalized because most easily operationalized. And one should not underestimate the genius of capital, no less than the state, for remaking the world so it will better fit some simplistic model and thereby make the model more true. 
As the Google dork said, human beings need to be less idiotic. That is, more like computers. That is, more legible to systems of control and better adapted to the need of the system for clean inputs. <clears throat> uh, Hannah, little known fact, Hannah Arendt's first husband was named Gunter Anders. Um, he actually lived in Santa Barbara during the war. He spoke of, quote, the rising cost of fitting man to the service of his tools. Iris Murdoch said that man is the animal who makes pictures of himself and then comes to resemble the pictures. So here's the real mischief done by conceiving human intelligence in the image of the computer. It carries an impoverished idea of what thinking is, <clears throat> but it's one that can be made adequate enough if only we can change the world to reduce the scope for the exercise of our full intelligence as embodied agents who do things. Five to eight years ago, there was a lot of breezy talk, even now, I would say, by tech journalists and well-capitalized futurists <clears throat> about banning human drivers from the road, given the difficulties that arise when autonomous cars and human drivers have to interact, <clears throat> which has turned out to be a far uh, bigger engineering challenge than was thought anticipated. Of course, from a, bus a business perspective, <clears throat> it's ideal if we become dependent on some proprietary and opaque system overseen by a cartel of tech firms to do what we once did for ourselves, issuing in what Ivan Illich called radical monopoly. As the space for hum intelligent human action gets colonized by machines, our own capacity for intelligent action atrophies, leading to calls for yet further automation. The demands of skill and competence give way to a promise of safety and convenience, leading us ever further into passivity. Safety is the sentimental face worn by each of these anti-humanisms and does crucial work in legitimizing the post-political order. Which brings me to my third item, <clears throat> we are fragile. How are we to understand the dramatically different responses of our society to the Spanish flu of a century ago and to COVID today? There's an inverse relationship between the severity of these pandemics and the severity of measures to control them. In 2020, a fearful public acquiesced to an extraordinary extension of expert jurisdiction over every domain of life and a corresponding transfer of sovereignty from representative bodies to the unelected functionaries of various agencies. Notoriously, polling indicated that the perception of the risks of COVID outstripped the reality by one to two orders of magnitude. This is not surprising as official channels consistently favored scientific inter interpretations of a messy empirical landscape that induced fear even at the cost of omitting relevant context. As we now know, since the release of the Twitter files, the FBI, CDC, and various disinformation NGOs, themselves sometimes misinformed, worked closely with the social media companies to censor information they knew to be true, but which would tend to induce vaccine hesitancy or lessen the sense of crisis. The pandemic brought to the foreground a broader tendency in the West to govern by the invocation of emergency powers rather than by the avowed principles of representative government. Fear and a corresponding sense of fragility play an important role in this. I don't think you need to posit a conspiracy of hidden manipulators to understand this. There's a kind of gravitational pull in this direction, this exercise by the nature of the modern state. To grasp this, it helps to glance at the origins of modern politics, where the ruling principle is most plainly put forth. There we see that liberalism is not merely a political doctrine, but an anthropological project to remake man so he better fits the suppositions upon which the modern state pins its legitimacy. Namely, man is a vulnerable creature 
a potential victim in need of protection. I'm referring to the thought of Thomas Hobbes, and I'm influenced here by Mark Schiffman's account of the role of the victimological imagination in legitimating the modern state. First, in what sense is Hobbes a liberal? He's certainly no advocate of limited government, and the regime he imagines is basically monarchical. It's liberal in the sense that it's founded on consent. But it turns out this consent depends on a re-education program that reaches quite deep and is never finished. Hobbes offers a fable of human origins, the state of nature, according to which we are originally in a condition of acute vulnerability. Even after the rise of political society, civil war is always a threat and is the problem that his politics is meant to solve. The problem comes down to the fact that we're prone to pride or vainglory. <clears throat> this is based on a false consciousness in which we place too high a value on ourselves. <coughs> we then feel slighted and insulted when others fail to recognize us. Such aristocratic brittleness leads to faction and civil strife. The good news is that it can be overcome through a shift in perspective. If we, and especially the proud, come to identify with the weak rather than think ourselves strong. We are all potential victims, and this is the self-awareness that grounds political authority in consent. Out of fear, we consent to a social compact in which we all submit to Leviathan, whom Hobbes calls king of the proud. Liberalism begins with the politics of emergency, then. Leviathan is supposed to end the state of emergency. That's the whole point of it. But the emergency must be renewed over and over again if Leviathan is to thrive. This requires renewal of the consciousness raising program as well, cultivating the vulnerable self. This is the self that's implicit in the cult of safetyism that children are brought up in. It's also the guy you see riding his bicycle double masked. During COVID, there was a cult-like quality to public spaces in the Bay Area where I live, with lots of people wearing masks outdoors. And this has been creeping back, I've noticed, over the last few months. You have to think they know the facts by now. It may be that they're acting not out of fear for themselves or for others, but in a gesture of identification with the vulnerable one who's currently elevated. That would be the immunocompromised. How many of these are there, really? The answer might matter if hygiene theater did anything to protect them, but unfortunately it doesn't, as we now know from the you know, randomized control trials of mask efficacy. Note that in this Habesian dynamic, the perpetuation of a sense of crisis is intimately tied to victimology. Maybe this helps us understand how in the summer of 2020, the health emergency of COVID and the moral emergency of white supremacism seem to merge into a single thing. Social distancing guidelines had to be adjusted to accommodate mass protests. Uh, this is the George Floyd moment, as these two served to advance the general crisis. Again, you don't need a conspiracy of hostile elites to explain this. It's sufficient to have a shared political morality that sacralizes the victim, issuing in moral demands that are categorical, even if contradictory. Victimological dramas provide a mood of permanent moral emergency, justifying an ever deeper penetration of society by bureaucratic authority in both the public and private sectors. So the latter would include HR departments and university administration, for example. <clears throat> now, in order to have victims, it helps to have victimizers, which brings us to the final item on my list, which is that we are haters. Um, I'm, I'm actually, I'm going to cut out like six or seven pages here because we want to leave room for discussion. So I'm just going to touch on the, the hater um, idea briefly. No author in the pagan or biblical traditions, or indeed in the modern tradition, would not agree that we are ruled by our passions. Not simply or irredeemably, but for the most part, 
We are cruel, we are selfish, we are small-souled in any number of ways. We are prone to hate, if you like. What's novel, I think, is the role that the accusation of hate plays in forestalling the possibility of a politics of solidarity among those who are said to be haters. The majority is demoralized and dispirited through the inculcation of racial shame, shame at its hateful past, or the attribution of blood guilt that can't be expiated. Such a population disappears politically through a kind of moral self-erasure, leaving the field relatively clear for top-down projects that may not be popular. <clears throat> So, um, again, I'm going to skip a bunch here. It, rather than attribute a cynical manipulation to um, um, manipulate, uh, which would require an oligarchy that is clear-sighted and competent, um, I offered what I hope is a more realistic psychology that tries to understand the appeal of this kind of politics. The idea of a common good has given way to a partition of citizens along the lines of a moral hierarchy. The decision-making class has discovered that it enjoys the mandate of heaven, and with this come certain permissions, certain exemptions from democratic scruple. The permission structure is built around grievance politics. Very simply, if the nation is fundamentally racist, sexist, and homophobic, I owe it nothing. More than that, conscience demands that I repudiate it. So in the longer version, I, I uh, invoke Hannah Arendt and Christopher Lash, uh, both writing about the 60s and, and how the civil rights movement got transformed from its original um, iteration into something that has these, this quality to it. So I'm going to skip over that uh, very rich and interesting history. The precondition for the arrival of a post-political condition is the moral disqualification of the demos, just as the precondition for the arrival of the driverless future is convincing people that human beings are terrible drivers. On both fronts, the people are incompetent. Systemic racism, uh, in, the, in its current sort of iteration, provides the premise for the growth of the immense tutelary power that Tocqueville foresaw. If war is the health of the state, racial shame is the engine of administration. It makes men less proud, more administratable. So, I'll conclude. The line separating innocent victims from guilty oppressors, or the compassionate elect from the deplorable haters, has come to bear a lot of weight in a post-Christian politics that has forgotten the universal nature of sin. In the Gulag Archipelago, Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote, the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, um, but right through every human heart. This truth, if recovered, could have a moderating effect on projects for social control, which are so often rooted in a lack of self-awareness about this doubleness in our nature. Such a lack of self-awareness is evident when, under the pretense of their own rationality and benevolence, some men seek to manipulate other men as beings incapable of reason, or deputizing themselves as racial tribunes, they treat others as incapable of civic friendship across demographic divides. Those who adopt such postures exempt themselves, of course, from what they posit about human beings in general. Special pleading is a perennial tendency of rulers when they don't feel themselves responsible to an authority higher than themselves. The pride of our rulers is perhaps better called arrogance or hubris. We're all subject to this vice. We differ on the scale in which we have the opportunity to act on it. But pride can also mean something positive. Indeed, something that's indispensable to any politics that, be that could be called free. It's a readiness to make a claim on one's own behalf, 
and to stand up for the dignity of the human animal as a creature capable of reason and generous feeling. Such pride is what C.S. Lewis called chest in his magnificent essay, Men Without Chests. It is Plato's thumos, the evaluative capacity that assigns praise and blame. It's also a man's concern that he be valued rightly himself and not disparaged as a slave incapable of self-command. It provides the motive force for his pursuit of excellence. But what, what is excellent? Well, Thumos works in concert with Eros, which has a perceptive dimension in Plato. We're erotically attracted to beauty because it carries intimations of good, that is, of an objective order of value. These intimations give thumotic striving its proper direction. Thumos without Eros would be mere self-assertion. Lewis points out that every civilization rests on a conviction about the existence of objective good. The denial of such an objective moral order is a truly novel development in the modern West and has a disheartening effect. The debunking of the metaphysical stature of the good appears to have short-circuited the prideful basis of self-government because it's made it harder to perceive the degradation of man that comes when he's treated as raw material for a kind of social cybernetics. That is, he's not treated as a creature who has an inherent worth that must be recognized. That worth lies with his participation in something greater than himself, which he is erotically attracted to. On the Christian understanding, man is fallen, yet drawn toward a perfection that is in fact the source of his being, in the image of which he was created. When it's in good order, Thumos provides the motive force for this movement toward excellence. It's a man's spirited readiness to overcome the sloth and distraction that tend to make him, well, stupid, fragile, hateful, and re replaceable. The very image of the human being favored by our conditioners. It's a half image that can be made more fully true by a politics predicated on it and by an economy in which a few profit by bringing this degraded picture further to fruition. We can regard the doctrine of the incarnation, God becoming man, as an assertion of the dignity of man. It's a revelation that in principle could serve to moderate the contempt of the powerful. But let's not count on that. What seems certain is that it is a revelation that can only embolden the self-respect of the citizen. If taken to heart in numbers, it may lead a people to insist on reclaiming that status for themselves. Thank you.